Thank you, Florian, for that warm introduction and in general for this just wonderful invitation. Um, it, as I have now remarked to multiple people, um, having been somewhat solo researching the virtual for about you know, eight to 10 years at this point to be in a place in which there are multiple people interested in the virtual is a real treat. Um, so I can't think of a better audience with whom to, to share this work. Um, so I don't think it would be um, an audacious claim for those in this room to insist that the virtual is vital to understanding the present human condition. And yet, precisely because of its semantic opposition to the real, the importance of the virtual is easily overlooked or dismissed. Anthropologist Tom Belstorff has argued for years that the more appropriate binary coupling is the virtual and the actual, the digital and the physical. This makes it possible for the analyst to address the reality of virtual experiences. While this might have conceptual credence, in everyday speak, at least in English, we still do insist on talking about virtual worlds as opposed to real worlds or being IRL. The virtual remains colloquially understood as an impoverished instantiation of the real. And as le at least as I experienced while teaching on Zoom during the COVID lockdowns, for many activities and given current technical capabilities, the virtual does not yet seem to be an adequate substitute for the real. And yet, as I just said, its study is vital. As Florian just said, VR and the virtual are embedded in the real. In the research that I'm sharing today, I came to understand how virtual reality can serve as a crucible for understanding something about what reality has become or is becoming. I'll return to this shortly, but let me first state that my research is ethnographic in nature, as well as historically and geographically situated. What I'm discussing today is a research project that specifically focuses on VR's mid 2010s commercial reemergence and how a community in Los Angeles became invested in its success. Oops. There we go. So, I became interested in VR shortly after Facebook purchased the headset company Oculus in 2014. At that time, visions of VR futures spanned from it revolutionizing education and medicine to it being what boosters described as the last platform, a vehicle for accessing a fully immersive digital world in which any experience would be possible. The imaginary that I was most intrigued by was one which framed VR as an empathy machine, a medium capable of allowing a person of privilege to enter the life world of another and in so doing better understand and empathize with another's reality. I was struck by this formulation for many reasons, including its eerie resonance with anthropology's method of ethnography by which we similarly carry out our field work with the hopes of being allowed into others' life worlds, believing such immersive methods to be central to understanding different realities. Anthropology this made apparent ought to be engaged with this technology as it developed. I began my field work with a psychology laboratory, the only place in 2015 where virtual reality research was being conducted at my university. From that vantage point, and part of this is documented in one of the articles that Florian mentioned, I, I was able to learn the basics of working with VR and witness the excitement that accompanied the releases of affordable headsets, allowing the lab to shift from devices that cost $20,000 to those costing $500. In this context, however, VR was a tool and already black boxed from its circumstances of origin. As the empathy machine weighed on my mind, it propelled my research toward understanding how and why bettering humanity had become so central to the mid 2010s resurgence of virtual reality. How it allowed this lab, which had conducted research on VR and human perception for decades, access to new, less expensive devices. I needed to leave the laboratory and go to where this belief originated in order to understand how it continues to drive VR development. I was surprised when this led me not to the presumptive center of the US tech scene, Silicon Valley, but instead to Southern California, 
And here, let me apologize for the US centrism of this talk. There certainly are other global centers of the VR industry, but my research has focused on how the technology has developed in the US. Um, the global circulation of VR, as is clear from the photo I took yesterday while waiting for the train in Frankfurt to take me here, um, it, it circulates much beyond the US as well. So while the significance of Los Angeles as a place for VR development was at first surprising to me, it slowly began to make sense. After all, the empathy experiences that were being produced in the mid 2010s were primarily cinematic in nature, immersive stories filmed in 360 video. In many cases, these were being produced by traditionally trained filmmakers, and thus there was an active VR community in Los Angeles, where Hollywood expertise is in abundance. My forthcoming book, and yes, the proofs just went off yesterday, um, In the Land of the Unreal, draws insights gathered from spending a year in Los Angeles with the VR community in 2018. When I said before that the virtual can act as a crucible for understanding shifts in reality, what I more specifically mean is that attending to how something like VR comes to be desired at specific times and places harbors insights about the problematics of reality for that moment and location. In the case I'll be discussing today, the good futures promised by VR's emergence were in stark contrast to the US political crisis marked by Trumpism, and which I refer to in my book more broadly as a reality crisis. The crisis has unfolded on multiple levels. There were the small and the small and large alternative facts spun by the administration, ranging from misinformation about hurricane paths to refusal to believe election outcomes. But there was also a cultural reality crisis in which growing experience about certain lived experiences of being black in America, of being an immigrant or a refugee, of being a woman in the workforce, exposed how uneven experiences of everyday reality are to begin with. For the liberal creative class that was rallying around VR in LA, the political fracturing of the real, alongside the moral imperative to take seriously dif different lived realities, created a paradox. A fractured reality poses a problem for social action. How can a go common good be served when the commons no longer exists? But it is also the very acknowledgement of different realities that allows VR's aspirations to be articulated. VR empathy experiences acknowledge different realities. Indeed, they promise that they, they promise insight into the reality of, for example, being black, being a refugee, being a woman. And in virtually occupying these different realities, the imagination was that a common reality would therefore be reestablished. These social positions would be deemed real and thus demand significant political and social action. VR's positioning as a good technology, a technology in service of bettering humanity, was specifically attached to this mission of repairing reality, even as the mechanisms of the immersive experience maintained differences between realities. As I pieced together this logic, I reached for language that could capture the instability of reality and the real. I proposed the unreal as a way to mark circumstances when reality's multiplicity demands attention. The unreal captures a strain of US politics in which it has been, it has been advantageous to undermine reality, as well as the experience of a bot embodying another in VR, which, as I just explained, simultaneously treats reality as multiple and capable of being unified. The unreal is a structure of feeling, intuiting that reality seems to have become something else, that it has multiplied, has fractured, has become virtual. To provide a little bit more background, let me briefly explain three cultural conversations that were deeply salient during fieldwork and created the background of concern upon which fantasies of VR's good futures were constructed. As just discussed, the first was the inescapability of Trumpism. While I was engaging a logic of VR that suggested how being virtually in another's shoes could cultivate a sense of shared humanity, Trump administration policies 
from separating families at the US-Mexico border to repeals of protection for marginalized citizens made it very clear that some lives, some people's humanity mattered more than others. Trump's multi-pronged attack on expertise and institutions shook the faith that there even existed a common reality. However, the Trump administration was not alone to blame for what felt like reality's fracturing. During my fieldwork, public awareness grew around social media's role in spreading misinformation and crystallizing distinct reality bubbles. The biggest investor in VR's resurgence, Facebook, came under intense public scrutiny in March 2018 when news broke that the company had allowed the firm Cambridge Analytica to harvest user data without consent, such that they could serve up targeted political advertising to their clients, which included Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. The public airing of this scandal inaugurated the tech lash, shattering the myth that technology necessarily serves public interest. The final cultural conversation that shaped my fieldwork was in late 2017, as I was preparing to move to Los Angeles, reporting revealed a pattern of sexual assault by Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. From this emerged the Me Too movement, which while global, took on particular salience and importance in LA, where women organized for better treatment in Hollywood and beyond. These conditions can all be understood as unreal insofar as they acknowledge unstable and conflicting realities. Against this instability, it also becomes possible to imagine reshaping reality and building new and better worlds. The unreal creates room for fantasies to proliferate. And for the rest of this talk, I will tease out the fantasies that circulated in the community I studied. Three fantasies were central to the promises of VR as a good technology, and thus a remedy to Trumpism, the tech lash, and Me Too. The empathy machine captures a fantasy of being through which we can occupy the virtual position of another in order to forge understanding across distance. The fantasy of uh, representation captures the belief I encountered throughout fieldwork that women were VR's natural stewards that the technology's success was tied to the empathetic intuition of female innovators and creators. And finally, I argue that the fantasy of being and, rep and representation were able to flourish because they were being promoted in a place where fantasy was so ubiquitous. Indeed, a place that given Hollywood's looming presence is famous for its production of fantasy. I use the word fantasy advisedly in order to make it clear that VR is not inherently good, will not necessarily create empathy, is not innately well suited to female cre creativity. But this was the system of thought that I encountered during fieldwork that maintained the alternative reality that VR could be a good technology. So I'll now take each of these fantasies in turn. Fantasies of being have always been central to VR. In its earliest technical imagining, VR offered a fantasy of being in a simulated world. This is a cybernetic fantasy first articulated by computer scientist Ivan Sutherland in a 1965 essay titled The Ultimate Display. The Ultimate Display, Sutherland wrote, would be a, quote, looking glass into a mathematical wonderland an opportunity to explore concepts, concepts not realizable in the physical world, but only in the computational world. Sutherland first describes the path he expects computing to take, predicting that computers will soon be able to display graphics, that keyboards will be the standard interface, and a light pen will enable one to drag, drag objects around. But Sutherland is caught in a romance of a wonderland, and thus also presents a different direction that computing could take one centered around what he calls a kinesthetic display or what we might today call an immersive display that would work in conjunction with sound and smell, and smell interfaces. He imagined a display in which one's body both directs and responds to the computer. Being embodied in a simulated world would in turn provide the user with the ability to know that which is otherwise unknowable. The ultimate display is a fantasy of being completely embodied in a simulated world. To quote Sutherland again, a chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in, handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining, and a bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. 
In pursuit of this ultimate display, Sutherland and colleagues built the first head-mounted display a few years later when he was at Harvard. The hardware, which is pictured here, required to place one in a simulation was so cumbersome and the display so heavy that they called their contraption the Sword of Damocles, as it had to be suspended from the ceiling to counterbalance its heft. Wearing the Sword of Damocles, one could see a 3D rendered wireframe room and moving one's head around, see the different walls marked with the cardinal directions to distinguish one wall from another. Following this project, Sutherland sensed that achieving the ultimate display was a ways off and moved on to other research areas. The Sword of Damocles was an appropriately mythic proof of concept that never fully receded from engineers' imaginations and inspired subsequent decades of work to build a system that could bring one more fully and comfortably into a simulation. In the 80s and 90s, more HMDs were built and tracked gloves provided rudimentary interfaces for interacting with and exploring low resolution virtual worlds. Despite the continued focus on embodiment and feeling present in VR, fantasies of being during this period morphed into the fantasy of a freed mind achieving its potential. This is a consequence of VR becoming entangled with a broader set of ideas and innovations such that virtual reality as a signifier of an immersive headset enabled experience gave way to an imaginary of virtual realities, which included VR experiences, but also activities as diverse as sending an email, logging onto a bulletin board service, or role playing in a virtual world. Particularly, particularly in the 80s and early 90s, virtual reality, virtuality, and cyberspace became interchangeable concepts, both in academic literature as well in public vernacular. This interwoven set of experiences and terminologies impacted VR's conceptual and material develop, development, as well as its attending fantasies of being. In particular, the cyberpunk of William Gibson an aesthetic and philosophical orientation fully realized in the Wachowski Matrix films offered a fantasy of being premised on a severed connection between mind and body. Sandy Stone, drawing on ethnographic work with 1980s VR engineers, as well as more casual denizens of early online worlds, articulates the significance of Gibson's Neuromancer, in which cyberspace was envisioned, noting how, quote, Gibson's novel and, this, um, and the technological and social imaginary it articulated enabled the researchers in virtual reality or under the new dispensation cyberspace to recognize and organize themselves as a community. Gibson contrasted cyberspace with the disdainful meat space inhabited by our physical bodies. In this imaginary, one doesn't put on a headset but rather jacked in to cyberspace, bypassing the body so that the mind could be unburdened by its fleshy limitations. Free your mind, Morpheus instructs Neo in the Matrix before impossibly leaping between skyscrapers. In these fictional cyberspaces, a bullet could still kill you. There remained a link between mind and body, but the body was otherwise inconsequential. VR evangelists of the 1990s hyped this disconnection between mind and body. John Perry Barlow begins his essay, Being in Nothingness, which appeared in the cyber enthusiast periodical Mondo 2000 with the exc exclamation, suddenly I don't have a body anymore. Barlow makes this claim even though the opening passage is a very physical and embodied description of his learning how to use a prototype VR headset and glove to grip a virtual object. In hyperbolically denying his body, Barlow aligns his VR experience with the fantastical Gibsonian vision of being a mind in a world of information. This aspiration for disembodiment traveled between the various virtualities of the time, shoring up this fantasy and making it all the more potent for VR. This was the popular understanding of and advertising for the internet in the 90s. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, reads a 1993 New Yorker cartoon depicting a dog sitting at a PC explaining to a puppy pal that his online persona is disconnected from his canine body. On the internet, there is no race or gender or age, only minds, proclaims a 1997 commercial for the telecommunication company MCI, RIP. 
This fantasy of the free mind floated back from science fiction and popular imaginaries and embedded in late 20th century theories of the virtual. In this context, the mind, the freed mind was a worry stone for cyber theorists. Even when the fantasy was accepted, it was not assumed to be an unalloyed good. Artist and theorist Simon Penny diagnosed VR as impoverished. The virtual body is merely a body image that is lacking in the sensorially rich experiences that come from embodiment. Penny writes, virtual reality leaves the meat body on the chair. It is a confirmation of rather than a liberation from Cartesian dualism. Virtual reality is thus about dislocation and disassociation. One does not take one's body into virtual reality, one leaves it at the door. Media studies scholar and uh, Balsamo likewise affirms, quote, the conceptual denial of the body that renders it excess baggage. Balsamo goes on to argue that this presumed disembodiment obfuscates the male bodily desires and assumptions that in fact structure virtual worlds. Thus, the white able-bodied male experience becomes the naturalized and default experience of VR. Balsamo, like other feminist theorists at the time, sought to trace the power structures that enabled such fantasies of disembodiment. Still others pushed further, questioning this very claim of the freed mind and seeking a material regrounding for understanding virtual reality. Returning to Sandy Stone, she acknowledges the identity experimentation that occurs in cyberspace that might suggest a, di a disconnection between mind and body. But Stone also grounds this disembodiment in a particular male fantasy born of Silicon Valley neuromancer reading engineers. Thus, Stone cautions the reader not to mistake the fantasy for the reality. She writes, no matter how virtual the subject may become, there is always a body attached. Feminist scholars working to recenter the body in analyses of the virtual had difficulty making their arguments stick precisely because of the diversity of experiences that virtual realities had come to stand for in the 90s and early 2000s. With the deflation of the commercial VR market, most people ex people's experience of the virtual came through the desktop computer. Ever more graphically rich virtual worlds proliferated as did the growth of email, the World Wide Web, and attending internet applications. People dialed into cyberspace, primarily navigating it, as Sutherland anticipated, with keyboard and mouse. While this was no doubt a tactile experience, it was not embodied, allowing technologists to continue to promising a raceless, genderless, and thus bodiless virtuality. Crucially, however, when VR reemerged in the 2010s, it could do so with a focus on headset facilitated experiences and without being conflated with the dated concept of cyberspace. In a world of digital natives, the experience of VR is easily distinguishable from the experience of the internet. This era of VR is marked by an engaged body, be it through a swiveling of the head or moving oneself fully through the world. With high fidelity graphics and body position tracking, the first people who tried prototypes of what would become the Oculus Rift VR headset in the early 2010s did not have to overhype the technology. It was an experience, however mediated, of being elsewhere. The fantasy of the mind freed from the passive body of the previous decades could be replaced by the fantasies of being fully embodied and engaged. In contrast to The Matrix, in the 2018 Spielberg-directed movie Ready Player One, the characters suit up rather than jack in. Through headsets, haptic suits, and stationary treadmills, the protagonist avatars move in sync with their body, with their physical bodies, in contrast to the suspended animation of the protagonist's physical bodies in the Matrix. The body was no longer something to be discarded or transcended, but necessary for virtual being. Significantly, the virtual world was depicted as a place of emotional growth in Ready Player One, and this growth in the form of budding romances and friendships could be fully realized back out in the actual world. This imagination by which embodiment catalyzes emotional change is the logic that underpins claims that VR can make a better human. As LA-based VR journalist Nani Dilapena described in a 2015, a 2015 TED Talk, 
What if I could present you a story that you would remember with your entire body and not just with your mind? The body is figured as a gateway toward feeling present in a VR experience, which in turn fosters personal growth and awareness. The fantasy of being a mind freed from the body had shifted to a fantasy of being a sensing, feeling, embodied human. Sutherland's ultimate display had morphed into the ultimate empathy machine. The description of VR as the ultimate empathy machine came from the top, a title of a TED talk given by an LA-based filmmaker who pivoted to VR after being inspired by the work of Nani de la Pena. This filmmaker later explained that he was riffing on a quote by film critic Roger Ebert, who had described film as an empathy machine. With VR rendered as the ultimate empathy machine, it was no longer attached to the computing interface as was the case for Sutherland's pathbreaking work, but instead to filmmaking and to Hollywood. As VR's fantasy of being shifted from a freed mind to an embodied, a freed mind to embodied empathy, the drivers of this narrative also shifted from Bay, Eng Bay Area engineers to Los Angeles storytellers. What difference did it make then that uh, for VR to be a product of a place once described by anthropologist Hortense Powdermaker as a dream factory? Throughout 2018, I was aware of how conversations in LA about technology felt different from those that I had encountered during previous research in Silicon Valley. But it was not until I had returned from fieldwork and began analyzing my notes that I fully grasped what was going on. I noticed that while many interlocutors were constantly talking about technology, there were multiple tacit definitions of this word at play. Sometimes VR was discussed as an emerging technology, similar to flying cars, AI, and robots, while other times VR was tacitly understood as what I call a cinematic technology, similar to motion capture or visual effects. Let me illustrate this distinction by describing a few conversations I had while at one of my field sites the Technicolor Experience Center, or TEC. My research brought me into different pockets of LA's VR community, from university classrooms to co-working spaces to startups, and eventually, after building up a robust network, to Hollywood. I spent six months as a scholar in residence at TEC, an outpost of the famed special effects company at which employees were scoping out the potential of VR for their industry. There, studio executives came to try out VR and experimental projects were produced using tech's motion capture soundstage. It was here that I could most clearly discern distinctions between VR's invocation as a cinematic technology versus an emerging technology. As a cinematic technology, VR was variously imagined either as or alongside production and post-production techniques that are employed to enrich the storytelling experience. Toward the end of my fieldwork, one of Technicolor's VFX subsidiaries used Tech's mocap stage to demo their virtual production pipeline to major studios. As traditional films increasingly rely on performance capture and CG environments, directors and actors draw more and more from their imagination when filming. A shoot might entirely be actors in motion capture suits performing in front of green screens, posing a creative problem of not quite knowing what they are acting against or in what embodied form their performance will ultimately be rendered. Virtual production platforms allow creatives to see and even manipulate the CG assets on, on set, work that has usually been relegated to post-production. On the day of the demo, Karen, the head of the studio that was selling these virtual production tools, impressed upon me that virtual production is not VR. Sure, VR headsets are used by the directors and cinematographers, she said, to decide where to place the camera, but she's selling much more than that. She was selling a production pipeline. In fact, Karen said, as she leaned in with a conspiratorial whisper, cinematographers hate VR because they can't apply techniques like zoom and pan. They are deprived of their storytelling language. I probed further on this point. Why is there so much resistance in Hollywood to VR? I had observed that my colleagues at Tech were, were often bemoaning Technicolor's executives and other big studios' dismissal of their work. Karen diagnosed a general technophobia in the industry. Karen had worked on Polar Express, 
the first animated movie to be filmed entirely with performance capture. A technological triumph, but, she lamented, it was criticized for looking creepy as the animation fell into the uncanny valley. Similarly, when in a separate conversation, the director of tech described Hollywood's resistance to new technology, she emphasized that if you can't prove to the studio head that it makes money, they don't care how magical it is. In the Hollywood context, VR was a cinematic technology, whether as a tool for traditional filmmaking or itself a medium of entertainment, and it demonstrates its worth by strengthening both storytelling potential, but importantly also the bottom line. Increasing, um, in contrast, as an emerging technology, VR is bundled with slightly different artifacts and concerns. Sorry, I would like to get that rid of that, but I'm not going to touch anything. Um, so VR is bundled with slightly different concerns, both at tech and events around town, VR, artificial intelligence, and blockchain were often discussed together, kind of this triumvirate. Um, and all three of them can see here mapped on this hype cycle, which is an annual graphic produced by the marketing firm Gartner that tech communities are very familiar with and often draw lessons from. In LA, these technologies, VR, AI, and blockchain, indexed both a future of entertainment, but also a more general tech-saturated future. This brought VR into conversations textured by techno-optimism and cautioned by ethical concerns that were newly being discussed in the wake of the tech lash. Another event on tech's mocap stage serves as a counterpoint illustration. At a day-long conference on immersive technologies, the final panel was a conversation between three tech employees and two collaborators. After a day of talks that touched upon world building and VR, augmented reality tabletop games, a VR environmental conservation project, AI and location-based entertainment, and also an investment perspective on immersive technologies, this final panel concerned digital doubles. Also referred to as virtual humans, a digital double in this context implies a complete mapping of oneself into a virtual world. It includes not only an avatar with visual likeness, likeness, but potentially also an AI interface such that one's digital double could act in the virtual world independently, but in alignment with one's IRL persona. The slide that served as the backdrop to this conversation depicted the different components that go into making digital doubles, including VR, software for facial rendering, the game, the game engines Unity and Unreal. Jake, a producer at Tech in his early 30s who studied film at both UCLA and USC before becoming interested in VR and learning the game engine workflow, chaired this panel. Though his expertise is in film and VR, this panel did not highlight VR as a cinematic technology, but rather positioned it alongside other emerging technologies. As Jake teased, they'd be discussing the, quote, weird future world we're going to live in where people are embodying virtual avatars, and there are real mechanical robots that humans can interact with. I was aware of Tech's interest in digital doubles, as on multiple days I had sat in the back room watching Jake and his colleagues build up a digital version of their colleague Erica. They were experimenting with different body and facial scanning technologies to create a digital Erica that in the near future, so it was imagined, would be powered by AI. Then one could be in VR and inter interact with Derica, their portmanteau for this digital Erica, who would look, sound, and respond like the actual Erica. So this weird future that Jake described and was discussed throughout the panel was one in which VR and other emerging technologies blurred distinctions between virtual and actual. Rick, the virtual production supervisor at Tech, who oversees the mocap stage and has worked as an animator and mocap specialist for over a decade in video games and movies, reflected on the challenging expertise needed to bring about realistic digital doubles. While five years ago, he would have said that computer graphics artists were needed, now he's seeing how machine learning has made great strides toward realism. And recall that this event occurred in 2018, well before all the public releases of generative AI apps, um, AI apps that, have that we've recently become familiar with. But this is exactly the technology that Rick is thinking of. While such deep learning, al deep learning algorithms might be an unexpected solution, 
Rick observed that because such an approach is easier to use and cheaper to apply than computer animation techniques, and thus outside of the control of entertainment experts, might there be a nefarious application of this technology? In the audience, I was thinking about the sudden rise of deep fakes, which in the summer of 2018 had just made it into popular consciousness. Rick speculated, quote, we could end up in a digital rights and blockchain future where I don't know what I'm looking at anymore, if it's real, if it's right. Jake built on this, asking the panelists about the ethical concerns that accompany the virtual human world. VR as an emerging technology was implicated in tech ethics conversations about privacy and Rick's worry over the inability to distinguish a real human from a virtual human echoed concerns about fake news. That VR is both a cinematic technology similar to color processing, VFX and computer graphics, and also an emerging technology similar to robots and flying cars meant that while my interlocutors seem to be using a common language of technology to communicate ideas about VR with collaborators in Silicon Valley, local differences in meanings created frictions. While working on the set of a VR shoot a few months after I arrived in LA, a sound engineer described a tension she discerned between hardware development in Silicon Valley and content development in Hollywood. From the perspective of an Angelino, up north, they were unwilling to invest more in hardware, better headsets, while there was, until there was better content imagined as Hollywood's domain. But creators down in Los Angeles felt that they were poised to create this better content if only they had improved hardware. The next day, the assistant director made a point with added hostility. Content producers like her were being blamed for the industry's failure to launch, even though in the 80s estimation, it was the fault of Silicon Valley. Experts in both Hollywood and Silicon Valley were developing VR and used a common language to discuss its de development and hope for future, specifically a future with commercial success. But the models and pathways for success look very different if one is developing a craft oriented cinematic technology versus a consumer oriented emerging technology. While my interlocutors recognized that there was some kind of misunderstanding happening between VR innovators in Northern and Southern California, they couldn't find a solution as the common language of technology concealed these different orientations. The VR community in LA cared deeply about and discussed in detail technological development. But I came to realize through my fieldwork that technology meant something different in this place of fantasy. What technology was and could be what technology was and could be expanded in scope in LA and this is a point that i'll return to at the end of the talk so i'm just placing a little pin there. So moving on to the last fantasy the fantasy of representation. Even before the me um, even before the me Too movement, there was an explicit conversation about gender equity within the VR community by promoting the presence of women in VR. Such inclusion efforts were emphasized as what could distinguish VR from the poor treatment women and minorities received in both the tech and entertainment industries. I focused my research not only on the VR community in LA, but more specifically on the women in this community. I wanted to understand the fantasy of representation that empowered women to think that VR which as noted when describing its earlier fantasies of being originated from very masculine ideations. Nonetheless, they thought how VR could elevate and empower their voice. There were two distinct but reinforcing narratives about women and VR that circulated during fieldwork and supported the fantasy that VR could be an industry led by and rep led and represented by diverse voices. The first narrative was that it was time for women to lead and the Me Too movement intensified this resolve. The belief that women should lead the VR industry was reinforced by a second narrative, which I'm going to explain in more depth. This narrative positioned VR as an inherently feminine technology. Let me describe a conversation that illustrates this logic. On a Facebook group called Women in VR, which was very active when I was doing my field work and because its moderators were LA based was overly representative of people and lo events located in the city. On that uh, Facebook board, I saw a post about an initiative called Girls Make VR. I messaged the poster, Maria, to see if I could learn about this project, 
which runs programs in the LA public school system to teach middle school and high school girls VR development. Maria introduced me to Ashley, the head of the nonprofit that oversees this work, who invited me to tea in her West Hollywood apartment. There I met with her, Maria, and Cynthia, a VR artist who is in town for a visit. In Minnesota, Cynthia runs a program both um, for both the homeless community and victims of domestic violence to create collaborative virtual art spaces where participants can experience a sense of community, even in the absence of others. For this work, she won a Woman in Tech Award and received funding from Facebook to, to further develop her artistic projects. At this afternoon tea, Ashley praised Cynthia's work telling me how it is a prime example of how VR is, quote, a bastion of creative inclusion. As we spoke about various ideas and projects, the conversation was peppered with observations about gender. Ashley, who affords her beautiful West Hollywood apartment and funds her nonprofit through work, through work as a voiceover actor in video games, recalled how the first time she was acknowledged as an expert in VR, she experienced a palpable feeling of empowerment. She reflected how this was this is a feeling women often don't get to experience in a male dominated tech industry and part of her motivation for teaching girls to create VR was to empower them in the same manner. How amazing she fantasized that the girls who participate in girls make VR might graduate high school with several years of VR experience. But there's another layer to this gender logic that must be understood there are plenty of initiatives to teach girls to code and otherwise strengthen the pipeline for girls in STEM. Many of the women I met during fieldwork believed that VR in particular was a technology best spearheaded by women. This argument draws on what are believed to be innate features of on the one hand VR and on the other hand women that complement one another. Jackie Ford Morey, a VR artist and educator who has worked with the medium since the 1990s, is described as one of the, go uh, one of the godmothers of VR and a respected member of LA's women in VR community. She suggests in her 2007 PhD thesis that the best VR emerges from a feminine approach, an approach that is well suited to immersive environments as it incorporates aspects of inclusion, wholeness, and a blending of the body and spirit. She draws on feminist theorist Hélène Sixou, who argues that the pen in all its phallic connotation has made writing a masculine medium. Mori suggests if a text is inherently male, then a virtual environment is inherently female in that it cultivates possibilities for becoming as does a woman when birthing a child. Just stay with me on this one, because um, I'm making it very clear that I'm not endorsing this essentialist position. In an interview, when I asked Maury why she thought women were drawn to VR, she made a similar point. She told me, you can't author a child. And I think letting go of that, that premier author mode of creation in VR, by creating a space where the user of VR completes the work, that this is a perfect medium for women. VR as a, as a, VR as a medium suited for women is, in Maury's theorizing, an aesthetic claim. However, when I heard women repeating the sentiment, many of whom knew Maury, it also became conflated with an affective claim, that VR as an empathy machine was another reason VR was the perfect medium for women. Returning to my conversation with Ashley, Maria, and Cynthia, Maria drew together these features of VR, features that she accepted as being true, with why women were the industry's natural leaders. Women, she explained to me, have an innate ability to create VR as we are more empathetic. This is the mindset one needs to be if you uh, to have if you are making impactful VR. Ashley agreed, and I could tell that this was a conversation the two of them had had many times. Ashley shifted from the affective skill women bring to VR and drew a more sociobiological affinity between women and VR. Men are hunters, she said. They can't help that they are predisposed to looking straight ahead, but women are gatherers and have a habit of looking all around. VR as a 360 medium is a more natural fit for women than men. So both because of an aptitude for empathy, empathy and a physical way of being a world, a being in the world of looking all around oneself that by this reasoning emerges from previous women's work as gatherers, women make better VR experiences. To once more be clear, 
I am not arguing that VR is naturally suited to women. Indeed, such a claim is troubling as it essentializes both technology and gender. This is, however, a framing that I encountered repeatedly in my field work, though not always as potent as when here focused through a hunter-gatherer lens or in Mori's reproductive analogy. But this provided justification for the fantasy of representation and made women feel as though they belonged in a space from which they might otherwise have felt excluded. So against the backdrop of Me Too, the growing discomfort with the outsized influence of big tech, and the general feeling of unreality by which it seemed that reality was becoming undone and needed repair, the VR community in LA wondered if there might be a different kind of future for women, for tech, and for the world. The fantasies of being, place, and representation worked together to maintain the possibility of this alternative reality. Women asserting leadership in the field justified their position by emphasizing a fantasy of being by which VR was best suited for embodied empathetic experiences. Significantly, women in LA who began their careers in media were able to claim the identity of woman in tech through their, through their acts application of expertise in storytelling to VR. This was enabled by the expansive definition of technology that existed in LA. That VR was more than emerging, an emerging technology, but also a cinematic technology, revealed to me how narrow our understanding of technology is when we simply adopt the definition that emerges from Silicon Valley. Recognizing the role that Hollywood plays in manufacturing our technological present and futures is essential for ongoing critical analyses of both the US and global tech industries. So while there is insight to be drawn from technological development taking place outside of Silicon Valley, and perhaps even inspiration to take from some of the visions put forth by the LA community, the fantasy of a better world is not alone enough to bring about change. Massive reform of structures and institutions are also needed and in a land where storytelling is imagined as possessing the power to change hearts and minds, that kind of work was not on the agenda for the community that I spent time with. While the fantasies offered might not become realities, they did nevertheless shape social action. Since concluding my fieldwork, these fantasies have shifted and in some cases receded. The empathy machine was eclipsed when Facebook in 2021 rebranded to Meta and announced their ambition to build the metaverse, borrowing the language from cyberpunk science fiction, just as engineers in the 80s and 90s had done when hyping cyberspace. This was a fantasy not of the discrete cinematic experiences of embodied empathy, but rather of a virtual world in which people could socialize, uh, work, socialize, and adventure. The metaverse has not had the staying power that Mike Zuck Mark Zuckerberg might have hoped for, and over this past summer, Apple tried to take control of the fantasy. At its worldwide development conference in June, CEO Tim Cook announced that they would launch the Apple Vision Pro headset in early 2024, beautifully timed for the launch of my book. Mm -hmm. um, the language Apple used to describe the product is notable. They studiously avoided virtual reality and the metaverse in their in their launch, even though this was the language used in media coverage. Apple's marketing approach has always been about offering a different narrative about technology. To IBM's motto, think, they responded with think different. And to Zuckerberg's metaverse, Apple has responded with spatial computing. But this is not a new phrase and has been used both by researchers in the 1990s with a slightly different formulation as the topic of a 2003 master's thesis from MIT's Media Lab. And in both cases, it signals the integration of virtual components into a physical environment. During my field work, the language of spatial computing was being used to describe augmented reality and was most associated with the Magic Leap headset, which debuted toward the end of 2018 as I was wrapping up my field work. As much, of, as, much as Apple quests to be different, the metaverse as conceived by Zuckerberg was also about physical and virtual integrations. Indeed, I would argue that the metaverse was an intentional rebranding of spatial computing to something that might conjure a more concrete imagination given its sci-fi lineage. So in this case, 
Apple isn't thinking differently at all, but simply pretending Meta has never existed and continuing a conversation that was already underway in 2018. Spatial computing, the metaverse, or whatever you might want to call it, is, however, the next phase of the fantasy of being. From the mind freed from the body to embodied empathy, the emergent corporate fantasy of being is one in which a user simultaneously is simultaneously virtually connected and physically present. This creates the possibility of the screen being fully integrated into one's field of view at all times, maximizing attention while also promising physical presence with loved ones. This is big tech's dystopian answer to the tech lash a fantasy of bringing people together while not sacrificing the profits to be gained by surveilling and monetizing our every action. The other fantasies I have mentioned in this talk were also present in Cook's announcement of the Apple Vision Pro, with Disney's CEO making a guest appearance, reminding us of the need to attend to Hollywood as an equally powerful driver of tech futures. And the fantasy of representation persists with female users in abundance and a black woman with natural hair implicitly telling the audience in the know that Apple has listened to past complaints about how the headset top strap exam um, excludes users with certain hair types. As you might have noticed, I have ended my talk back in Silicon Valley. Part of why I was drawn to Los Angeles is that there has there had been a moment when it seemed possible for a different understanding of tech and tech futures to emerge. While this wasn't necessarily a better vision, it unsettled assumptions and demanded different approaches. The empathy machine was far from perfect, but I do think it is more desirable than the race now being run between Apple and Meta. Ultimately, what I hope this research offers is the permission to think about VR and tech differently and especially to resist the fantasies of Silicon Valley. There are other fantasies after all, and in the land of the unreal, we can choose to construct our realities however we wish. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to questions and comments.